Good morning, and welcome again. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I am so glad that you are here with us this morning. I have to do a check-in with you. This is a little bit like your teacher on Monday morning collecting your homework. I want to know how many of you wore your bracelets this week. All right. <laughs> For those of you who weren't here last week, I preached about complaining. And we had an assignment which was to become more mindful of when we might be putting negativity or complaint out into the world and we were to switch our bracelet to the other hand when we did so as a mindfulness exercise. So I look forward to hearing from you all how that went this week. It was hard. <laughs> Let me change my bracelet. Um, <laughs> And I have another one, so I might as well just change it back. That I, I see some colleagues here, so I know they can confirm that this is really a legitimate bad dream that ministers have, that on a Sunday morning something happens with your computer and you aren't able to print your sermon. <laughs> and so there's something funky happening with my computer today. I'm not preaching from my laptop because I'm one of those hip, cool, millennial preachers. I'm not actually hip or cool at all. I'm terrified, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> and thanks for your patience. As this morning's prayer, I offer a poem by one of my favorite poets, Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry is an American novelist, poet, environmental activist, cultural critic and farmer. He taught for many years at the University of Kentucky but eventually resigned in favor of full-time farming on the Kentucky land that had been settled by his forebears in the early 19th century. He uses horses to work his land and employs organic methods of fertilization and pest control. He has a lot to say about corporate farming and other practices that he believes are ruining this country. But he also has a lot to say about poetry, about spirit, about connection, and about prayer. After this, our spoken prayer, we will sit together in silence. And then the choir will sing one of Barry's poems that was turned into a hymn in our hymnal, Singing the Living Tradition. How to be a poet. Make a place to sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience. For patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. Breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate slowly. Live a three-dimensioned life. Stay away from screens. Sorry, Wendell. <laughs> Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it. Of the little words that come out of the silence, like prayers, prayed back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. Amen. We are blessed to be a congregation full of poets, writers, and other artists. Poetry connects deeply with our spirituality, as you will see throughout the morning. 
from the Psalms of the Bible to ancient Sufi poetry to the Sanskrit epic, the Ramayana, poetry has always been a way for people to connect with spirit. Both writing and listening to poetry draws us closer to source. Poetry, like other art, comes through us, but it's not entirely our own. Call it muse, call it spirit, call it inspiration. I am reminded of the words many of the preachers spoke before their sermons at my Christian seminary. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. It is the prayer of preachers and poets, I think. I have asked this morning's poets to share with us just a few lines about what inspires them to write and then to share one of their poems with us. All of this morning's hymns are poems. And before we sing each of them, I will share with you a little bit about the poet. Let me first offer you this poem by Dorian Lowe, entitled, Tonight I Am In Love. Tonight I am in love with poetry, with the good words that saved me, with the men and women who uncapped their pens and laid the ink on the blank canvas of the page. I am shameless in my love, their faces rising on the smoke and dust at the end of the day, their sullen eyes and crusty hearts, the murky serum now turned to chalk along the gone cords of their spines. I'm reciting the first anonymous lines that broke night's thin shell, son under wood. A baby is born us bliss to bring. I have labored sore and suffered death, Jesus' wounds so wide. I am wounded with tenderness for all who labored in dim rooms with their handful of words, battering their full hearts against the moon. They flee from me that sometime did me seek. Wake now, my love, awake, for it is time. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. What can I do but love them? Sore-throated they call from beneath blankets of grass, through the wind-torn elms, near the river's edge, voices shorn of everything but the one hope, the last question, the first loss, calling. Slow, slow, fresh fount, keep time with my salt tears, when as in silks my Julia goes, calling, why do I languish thus, drooping and dull as if I were all earth? Now they are bones, the sweet ones who once considered a cat, a nightingale, a hare, a lamb, a fly, who saw a tiger burning, who passed five summers and five long winters, passed them and saved them and gave them away in poems. They could not have known how I would love them, worlds fallen from their mortal fingers. When I cannot see to read or walk alone along the slough, I will hear you. I will bring the longing in your voice to rest against my old, tired heart and call you back. Robert Frost once said, poetry is when an emotion has found its thought and the thought has found words. With that, I turn it over to our first two poets, Bruce de Saint Croix and Medir.
My dad from the age of 17 to 29 was in the Marine Corps and he wrote poems, much to people's surprise. So I grew up thinking everybody wrote poems and have since I was very young. Sometimes they come to me on dog walk, sometimes watching TV, and sometimes listening to the words of other people. I have two short poems. The first one is about one of the things that happens sometimes to me as a poet. It's called Need. I need to write a poem, and for three days none have risen. Not pen to paper, nor fingers to keyboard, the need is fierce and the fruit unformed. It is a physical pain, this need, a hysterical pregnancy without a birth. My patience wanes, the hunger grows. Come use and inspire a poem. My second poem is seasonal called Song. Come, awake, take my hand. The warmth of my touch can heal and let you forget, can help you remember. Come, embrace me. I will enfold you in light, awakening delight and pleasure that will quench your thirsty heart. Come, close dance with me in the sweet evening breezes under the starry sky, sway, step, turn, and glide. Come, lie beside me. Let me cover your body, caress you till dawn, and hold you while you dream. Sultry summer whispers in my ear, a seductive siren song singing, Come, 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 I am yours. So to me, poetry, too, is the language of the heart, of feeling, of sensing, of going beyond the linear mind, and of authenticity. And my inspiration to write poetry comes from the world of mysticism, of existential religiousness. And today's poem is inspired by a song of the 15th century mystic and poet Kabir. He sings, beyond seeking, I am free in my belonging. And I always wanted to write a poem about belonging, and Reverend Kate's invitation has inspired me to write the poem I'm sharing with you today. It's called, The Way I Belong to You. The shades are down in my prison home. A ghostly shadow is stalking me, regurgitating the past like an old Belgian cow, rehearsing the future like a young, ambitious actor. There is peace nor joy in my lonely home. My eyes are filled with tears of sorrow. But deep inside of me, I see a light. I wonder, does it know where I belong? Beloved light, please set me free from my restless mind. Help me find myself, my truth. You are my guide, my master. Show me the place where I belong. I picked and lost my battles against the storms of life. Now I throw myself into the wind. Let it lift me up in the beyond, whirling, whirling with Van Gogh skies, my destiny known solely 
to the source of light. Beloved Master, how could I have missed you? Where did you find me? Who am I to deserve your blessing? My house is melting under your rising sun. My eyes full of your green corn moon. I remember my belonging. Beyond hiding in my prison mind, I belong to the harmony of my heart and soul. Beyond whirling in the source of light, I belong to the stillness of a garden where, sh where flowers share with me their silent longing to be loved and taken care of. In return, they fill me up with their nectar of peace and joy. My eyes are flowing with tears of gratitude. A garden belongs to me the way I belong to you. And Kabir sings, beyond seeking, I am free in my belonging. Perhaps you remember writing your first poem, likely an acrostic, the words carefully chosen to begin with each letter in your name. Maybe you were asked to memorize poetry as a child, and some of those lines still linger there in the cobwebbed corridors of your mind all these years later. Some of you have turned to the comfort of poetry to mend your broken hearts, or have carefully copied over someone else's poem into a love note in a gallant feat of courtship. Perhaps at home you have a secret journal where you write your own poetry. And some of you have even published your works for all to see. Maybe one day, a hundred years from now, someone will fall in love with your words. As you will see in the second part of our service, poetry is one of the ways that artists share a sense of place speak out against injustice, and capture memory. The ancient Greek word for poetry translates literally as, I create. Another Robert Frost quote, a poem begins as a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a love sickness. Let us welcome now our next three poets, Roger Chavette, Kathleen Henry, and Lorraine Kujawa. My poetry, <coughs> excuse me, my poetry often comes from an unexpected moment in an intuition. Sometimes it's a single word or a line, and as I reflect on it, a poem grows. I rarely predetermine the shape of my poems. I let the intuition create the form. The poem I'm doing today, called Gentrification Never, was written May 28, 2007, a Memorial Day weekend. And I'm not sure what was happening that weekend. It seems there might have been a lot of commotion and everything going on. So it's really a call to presence. It's amazing how the times have changed and maybe it doesn't apply anymore. Gentrify Provincetown? <laughs> Surely you jest. This spit of glacial sand defies stabilization at will. Plays the sun, the sea, the sand and the wind against each other for the fun of it. Taking here, giving there, building here, dismantling there. The elements teach us all to coexist by the sea with the rhythm of a raucous twice daily tide. A blinding sun slithers across the dunes. 
while howling northeast winds carry sand and sea foam, washing ashore both visitors adrift and polished stones, weathering both through fair and bitter years, serving all much needed respite until they travel on. Gentrify Provincetown indeed. <laughs> no square peg in this spiral. Helltown cherishes its hunter-hunted heritage, captures and dismantles pirate ships along with their crews, takes it rough and tumbled salty merchant sailors, helt ben harpoonists weary from hunting the whale, and military ships loaded with rowdy sailors and marines. Gentrify Provincetown, sir or madam, was attempted decades ago by retiring sea captains who built elegant homes in various styles, but roll in their graves at the side of our guest houses. Our salt flat community sailed away one day, coming ashore on the sheltered resort beach, overpowered by numerous fishermen, lobstermen, scallopers, and clam diggers. Gentrify Provincetown? Sound then the death knell for the intuitive artists unable to paint here, for the poets forced into text, messages verse, text message verses, for the natural wonders replaced by Disney-esque rides. Harness the wind, the tides, and the sun to salvage a corner of green on the land. Ride the waves, climb the hills, fish the creeks, remove your shoes, imprint your feet. Track your passage on the sandy tidal beaches. Wear your lived-in, worn-out clothes. Drink your favorite nectar from a bottleneck. Disconnect your cell phone. Leave your PC notebook home. This is our province town, my friend. Washed ashore, down to earth, and never, never giving in to gentrification. Mostly my poems come from needing to figure something out. This poem came from my horror and shame that I couldn't remember something very important. Tiananmen Square, that tiny man praying mantis-like nose to nose to the row of tanks as big as the house he lived in, leans forward but slightly, no bow, no Asian bow, as if heading into a strong wind. He carries a shopping bag in each hand he wears a hat, his stance, the shape of exhaustion, but dense, stubborn, stoic, and oppositional as granite. He has made his final choice. He will not move. Our view is through a lens at a great distance. In that gallery also hang John John's salute, the naked Vietnamese girl napalmed fleeing straight into the camera, the college student crying for help over her fallen friend, Oh, and the pistol to the temple, and Tricky Dick's victory sign, and the balcony in Memphis, and the wall toppling down. I am a viewer of an artifact through many lenses and filters and frames. I am ashamed. Not only was I never there, I do not even remember what happened to him, that man in Tiananmen Square. Was he mowed down? 
Did he ever kneel, surrender? I cannot even remember what happened to the people of China. To the people of China. I want to believe my memory would matter, matter somehow, and I have felt the shame of all that. For the ones who do remember the ending, they have their work. I, who do not remember the ending, I too have mine. And but I know this, the tanks, their power changes real time. The nose to nose, little, little beautiful man, his power changes imagination beyond all time. However unique we are, we hold gifts from previous generations. This poem was one I had wanted to write for a while, giving me a greater understanding of my mother. It's called, How I Learned to Sing. Four men lifting on all sides, with my grandfather, a young man then, who worked in the mines welding a pickaxe six days a week, guided the top heavy piano, keys smacking of black and white into the parlor. My grandmother, a mother then, drying hands on her apron, her uniform that cast her as queen of the clapboard home, handmade board by board, taped together with yesterday's newspapers for warmth, Warmth emitting from a kitchen full of pies and canning, storing most goods not eaten by eight open mouths. The yes, yes of home life on Slattery Street in Pennsylvania, in a new land far from haystacks and fields of rich Polish soil. By boat they came, with nothing, now this piano, centered neatly like a bird in a nest, amid doilied velvet armchairs, made them rich. Richer still, the petals that powered the contents of the long black boxes, rolls of paper filled with small bee holes, made the ivory keys sing, if I loved you. My mother, only eight, spied the keys as they bounced and plucked the tunes filling the house like Carnegie Hall. As her mother cooked and baked for this newly elevated family, each day welcoming my grandfather face blackened from the coal mines into this place of wealth. My mother followed the keys, their mysterious plucking, like a kitten chasing a make-believe mouse, pumping the piano, caught the ivories before they ran away from her. She began to sing as she played. Sisters joined in, a finer chorus never existed. Years later, armed with her portfolio of lyrics, my mother, the star of her own musical, sang out at the kitchen sink, her throaty voice charming my brother and me as we clung to her housecoat. We three would all come to join in song in our Brooklyn apartment, devoid of pianos or violins or sopranos. This is how I learned to sing. Thank you so much to our Meeting House poets. I hope the rest of you poets out there will share your poetry with us one day too.